All right, so next uh, we're, we have the pleasure of uh, welcoming Monisha Ghosh again. Um, uh, Monisha is with the University of Notre Dame. She will be speaking to what 6G should learn from 5G, a measurement study of 5G millimeter wave. Um, uh, a bit about uh, Monisha. Monisha is currently a professor of electrical engineering at the University of Notre Dame and is a member of the Wireless Institute. She is also the policy outreach director as, uh, for Spectrum X, which uh, uh, Dr. Alex talked about, uh, the first NSF center for Spectrum Innovation and the co-chair for the FCC Technological Advisory Council Working Group on Advanced Spectrum Sharing. Her research interests are in the development of next generation wireless systems, cellular Wi-Fi and IoT, uh, with an emphasis on spectrum sharing and coexistence of applications and machine learning to improve network performance. Prior to joining the University of Notre Dame, she was the Chief Technology Officer at the Federal Communication Commission uh, at FCC, a Program Director at the National Science Foundation, a Research Professor at the University of Chicago, and she spent uh, 24 years in, in industry at uh, Bell Labs. Uh, Manisha, thank you for joining us. Uh, please take the floor. Yeah, I just wanted to add one more thing. Um, she has been a speaker in many of her conferences. She herself is an IEEE fellow. Uh, Manisha, sorry we are late. Uh, please uh, take it over. Thank you again. Uh, it's been a long day, I know, and it's always a challenge coming towards the end of a, a day like this, um, uh, where we heard so much about 6G and uh, everybody must be wondering what else is there new to say about it, right? So what I plan to do in the next few minutes, and I will try to uh, finish as early as I can to give the rest of the speakers some time, is uh, take a little bit of a look backwards uh, as we you know, set our sights forward. Uh, I think it's instructive as a community to look uh, back to see where we've come from. Uh, and towards that, I'd like to present some work that I've been doing with my collaborators, uh, my students, and some um, other collaborators in other universities uh, on doing measurement studies of 5G in the millimeter wave as well as in other bands. Um, so uh, the things I wanted to cover are, uh, no, I skipped to that too fast. Um, I, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the, just the state of 5G millimeter wave deployments in the US. Um, and I'll focus on Verizon because that's what we're measuring a lot. Um, and talk a little bit about coverage measurements that we have done in Chicago. Uh, and talk a little bit about the trade-offs between C-band and millimeter wave. We hear, heard a lot about the benefits of going higher up in frequency uh, and not that much about mid-band. Uh, what I'd like to do is present some results which uh, sort of give you the trade-offs of one versus the other. The third thing that I really want to uh, bring forward is something that I don't believe too many people are talking about is what is 5G millimeter wave doing in your handsets? Uh, are we designing receivers that can actually handle the kind of throughputs that millimeter wave um, is able to deploy? And then conclude with some key takeaways and recommendations. And these are my personal recommendations of what I think 6G should be looking at. Um, so again, as I mentioned, uh, you know, it's always good to look back as you're looking forward. So let's take a little bit of a look at 4G versus 5G. So we don't know what 6G is, but we know what 5G is, and we definitely know what 4G is. And that, and what you see on the right, uh, this comes from the GAO analysis uh, that was done, I think, a couple of years ago. Uh, and this was before 5G was being implemented. And if you look at the numbers, uh, we have to ask ourselves the following questions. Uh, were the 4G peak data rate and latency targets met? Uh, because many times when I talk about how, how I find 5G is not keeping up with what it was supposed to be, I'm told that, oh, it's early days for 5G, and that's absolutely true. But I think we can all agree that 4G is as mature as it's going to get. And I don't know whether I've ever seen a peak data rate of one gigabits per second reported on 4G anywhere. The good news, though, is that the user experience data rate is being met mostly. Now, is that because that it was set too late, low? Uh, 10 megabits per second doesn't really sound too much and 4G can easily get there. Uh, or perhaps that should be the metric we're looking for. What is the user experience data rate rather than the peak data rate? 
uh, 5G has got a peak data rate target of 20 gigabits per second. Uh, I'd be thrilled if we actually get got there, uh, but I'm pretty sure we'll get to 100 megabits per second. In fact, uh, in a lot of our measurements that we've done today, we find 4G very easily gets to 200 and maybe even 300 megabits per second. And it's doing that without using any new spectrum. It's doing that by uh, using unlicensed bands. It's doing that by using CBRS. Uh, and all of these are great things that people, I don't think, are paying enough attention to as they set their sights on 6G. And the question that now that I'm back in academia as a researcher is, uh, I've been struggling to find out is how do we know if what is deployed is actually meeting predicted expectations? You will read a lot in the press. You will read sound bites about how such and such person got a speed test of you know, five gigabits per second, but that does not really capture uh, what the user experience is in terms of throughputs, uh, data rates, latencies, um, connection densities and all of the other parameters that we care about in the cheese. Uh, the question I'm again asked a lot about when I talk about, uh, you know, academics doing our own measurements is why should academics be doing this? And I'm reminded of a quote, and it's, I think, possibly misattributed to Yogi Berra, but he had made the statement that in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. So what I've come to realize is that what we design on paper uh, and the performance that we expect is very different from what you actually get. Uh, then the next question I'm asked is, what about the many millimeter wave channel modeling efforts that have been done? And these are absolutely essential, crucial to start designing and deploying systems, but we cannot stop there. Uh, the key contributors to the millimeter wave channel in particular is the handset. And nobody really has a good model which takes your handset limitations and combines them with what your actual propagation over the air is. The environment you're in, uh, urban canyons make a huge difference. Uh, the, you know, buses going by, trains going by, all of this has a huge impact on the user experience of millimeter wave. The same is true for midband. We don't really have good mid-band propagation models based on actual measurements in the bands that we're deploying them with realistic massive MIMO. Uh, a lot of the measurements that we have in these bands are very old. They don't take into account our adaptive antenna array systems we have. And again, we resort a lot to uh, propagation modeling, uh, but we need to follow that up with actual measurements. The next question I get asked is, aren't carriers performing these? And surely they are. I'm sure they are. But as researchers, we do not have access to these results. Uh, and having been spent some time at NSF and fielded questions from researchers bemoaning the lack of data for their AI ML research, it's becoming extremely clear to me that the research the community that's working on AI ML needs access to data. And so it's incumbent on a lot of the research community to collect these measurements data, the measurement data themselves and make it available. The pros of doing this today as, as opposed to maybe even two years ago is these deployments are increasing. Today, uh, pretty much on a weekly basis, you have new 5G mid-band and millimeter wave deployments. And so our ability to actually measure performance and channel propagation in realistic environments. You know, we I showed you a picture on the first slide. You have base stations on lampposts and street corners, on uh, both sides of buildings and stadiums. We can make these measurements now using handsets, which is great because, as I mentioned before, the handset is part of the channel. Of course, uh, with anything uh, that you're trying to do with deployed infrastructure, controllability and repeatability are difficult. Uh, data collection, curation, and analysis needs to be ongoing because uh, in our work, what we measured two years ago in Chicago is a completely different picture what, from what we measure today. And so trying to understand how this ecosystem is evolving uh, is, I think, very important as we set our sights on 6G. So one of the examples of what we see is that, uh, for example, with millimeter wave, uh, and we've done measurements in quite a few of the major cities, uh, downtowns are fairly well covered, whether you talk about Chicago or uh, Denver, or we've done measurements in Boston, New York, 
uh, stadiums, uh, a lot of the big stadiums uh, where sport events happen have millimeter wave deployed. Uh, and airports, O'Hare, uh, uh, if you're ever in O'Hare and uh, the United Terminal has both AT&T and Verizon deploying millimeter wave indoors, which is great. However, what has happened is when C-band rolled out uh, in on January 19th of this year, and you go to the Verizon uh, website, their maps now basically call everything as ultra wideband. So uh, whereas in 2021 January, you could go to a Verizon website and figure out exactly when millimeter wave was deployed. Uh, and then these are our measurements, which you know we showed that yes, it's deployed kind of in that area, but the coverage is nowhere near what the networks say it is. Uh, and if you go to Verizon's website today, you'll just get a big blob of red, which is basically C-band plus millimeter wave. So you don't have any ability to figure out where millimeter wave is deployed right now. So we've had the advantage on the University of Chicago campus, where I was before I moved to Notre Dame in January, uh, of at least two millimeter wave base stations that have been deployed. Um, these are operational base stations. They didn't set it up for us to make measurements, but we've leveraged them a lot in the work we've done. So one is in an open area on a field, um, and this was the picture I showed you in the previous slide, where we've been able to take very detailed measurements. Uh, and by the way, all of these measurements are available to the community um, on signal strengths, uh, beam patterns, uh, throughputs, latencies, and a lot, number of other parameters. The other one is located strategically opposite a dorm, and you can see this, we're inside the dorm and we are taking measurements with our phones outside a window, which we've cracked open so that we get a line of sight to the base station. So what these two locations have allowed us to do is take a wealth of measurements of millimeter wave performance in the real world. So inside this dorm, for example, we've been able to take a lot of measurements on indoor outdoor coverage by you know, changing the window opening, clo open it, closing it, uh, and then measuring throughputs. In the interest of time, I'm not going to present those results today, uh, but if you're interested, please reach out to me. I can, I can share the data that we've collected over there. We use phones, as you see over here, mostly. We, uh, and we've used all of the 5G phones that are available today. The Pixel 5 is what we started off with. Um, the Pixel 6 Pro that came out lately, the Samsung S21, and we're recently going to start doing measurements with S22. We have a number of apps running on these phones. Uh, we use Speak Test, iPerf Testing. Uh, my student, Mama, developed an app which extracts a wealth of information about the network. Uh, we've used, uh, and we are beginning to use Qualipark recently by Rodion Schwartz, which allows us uh, very, very detailed network information uh, from the physical layer, you know, what MCS is being used, what beam is being used, what are the neighboring beams uh, in the area, uh, what are the radio resource control messages, uh, which allows us to really characterize what is going on with these networks. So we look at throughput, latency, and signal strength measurements, uh, along with a bunch of other parameters. And we've published a bunch of papers around our measurements so far. So the one thing I really want to talk about uh, in the few minutes I have left is a looking at something that people haven't paid enough attention to, which is what is the sustained throughput of a 5G millimeter wave? You will see a lot of results talking about the gigabits per second throughputs, and we see them too. But these are mostly reported by speak tests. Speak tests run for about five to 10 seconds, that's it. So you get a speed test that runs for five seconds, you get this excellent throughput uh, and it sounds great. And that's because uh, for that limited amount of time, the millimeter wave aggregates up to four to 800 megahertz carriers. So you really have a very wide bandwidth signal. But what happens when a large download activates the millimeter, millimeter wave connection for a longer time? So we actually ran across this problem because our collaborators in Florida and Miami were taking measurements and they kept saying, you know, we can't get this throughput to last for more than a few seconds. It always drops. Initially, we thought this was probably some network optimization that was taking place, but we very quickly realized that what was going on was this reception of this very high data rate heats up the phone and all phones have a skin temperature. 
that uh, which is for this particular phone was 43 degrees. And this is a blue line you see there. As soon as the skin temperature hits that limit, we would see that the throughput would drop. And the throughput was dropping because an RRC message was going back from the phone to the base station that there was a thermal event happening and that it needed to cut down the level of aggregation, which it would do. Four, carrier, four carriers would drop to one carrier, and after a while, it would hand over to LTE. We saw this repeatedly over time. We saw this in Miami, and then we started seeing this in Chicago when we started doing our measurements in summer. We didn't see it in winter. So we've corroborated this. Uh, we've taken measurements in San Francisco in many cities, and we see this repeatedly happening over and over again. And we recently, just about a month or so ago, corroborated this by our IR imaging. And I'd like to show a, a, a video, it's just a minute long, which explains what we did. So we basically created the construction on this location I showed you earlier, where we had a phone connected to the millimeter wave base station. We put another phone uh, let me just stop this for a moment, with a FLIR Pro uh, IR imaging camera on it. Uh, and then we took a bunch of measurements where we would run uh, HTTP down, uh, download traffic for about 10 minutes. We did this with the S21 plus phone. And then we would, uh, we would uh, capture a lot of the data on the phone itself, the throughput, the latency, how many carriers were aggregated, and then we processed this later. The day we took these measurements, this was on May 31st, the ambient temperature was 30 degrees centigrade. So this was kind of the location. We were about two meters uh, from the base station. And what you will see over here, I'm gonna stop this for just a second. So watch this little dot here. So this is a marker which tells you where the high spot in the phone is. So this is the IR image of the phone you're looking at. This is where one of the millimeter wave antenna arrays sits. This big region here is the CPU. And watch how this progression of the throughput happens as the download uh, starts. So it starts off with four times millim four millimeter wave channels being aggregated. Then as the temperature rises up to here, it drops, it goes to five LTE. And let me explain what five LTE is. It's two uh, licensed carriers aggregated with three LAA carriers. That pole that I showed you had LAA uh, installed on it too. So with LAA installed, you're still getting a good throughput of what 100 megabits per second, but nowhere near the 1500 um, megabits per second you were getting when all four millimeter wave channels were being aggregated. So as the phone, as the skin temperature drops, this blue line, it tries to get back to millimeter wave, and you see that that antenna point is heating up again. Uh, but it cannot sustain that much longer. And then the and then at uh, the 10 minute mark, you're back again to LTE. This is uh, when we went to the other side of the base station. Now we see that the other antenna array is uh, activated and we see the same thing happen. The same pattern happen again. Uh, right now, the, the hotspot is flipping between the CPU and the antenna, but clearly this very high throughput cannot be maintained for more than a few seconds. Uh, this is just one um, data set that I'm showing you. We have a lot of data taken over many days, many orientations uh, that I'm happy to share with anybody who's interested. So again, just to put it together, we did a lot more measurements over summer, winter. Uh, we did measurements where we put the phone on the ice pack. And so basically we tested this concept many different ways. And every time we came to the conclusion that the phone was heating up too, too much, too quickly, and the only way to get back the millimeter wave throughput was to cool it down. So on a winter's day when it's 10 degrees Fahrenheit outside and you're standing right next to the millimeter wave base station, it's great. You can sustain it for a very long time. I should point out that this is all download. So this is not even when the phone is transmitting. In fact, when the phone is transmitting, we don't see as much of a problem because the transmission happens on only one millimeter wave channel, so only on 100 megahertz channel. So clearly, the implementation of a very wide band channel over time is a challenge even today for handsets. 
And until we solve this problem, it's, it, it really is going to limit what the user is going to get over a millimeter wave. We've also done a lot of measurements uh, which are looking at just uh, spatial coverage. So this is an area, again, in Chicago, uh, outdoors. Uh, it's Hutchinson Park. Uh, it, many outdoor events take place here. It's a very dense millimeter wave deployment. In a 0.1 square kilometer area, there are six millimeter wave base stations, which also have CBRS and LAA on the poles. Um, the average distance between these base stations is only about 140 meters. Um, this was 39 gigahertz uh, deployment. And all of these poles were aggregating four millimeter wave carriers. With this kind of density, with very few, uh, with no buildings, with very few people in the area, we do end up with a very nice coverage. And we have uh, details uh, that uh, we can share with you, or uh, this link um, has, has the much better uh, map of uh, the millimeter wave performance. However, the question that we have in our mind is, given what we've seen with uh, the millimeter wave body absorption, uh, if we turn our backs to the base station, the throughput drops where there's this SNR RSRP drop of about 20 dB. Nisha, yes. uh, Nisha two minutes warning. Yes, yes, I'm almost done. We have a question about how uh, this will work when there are crowds. We are planning to go back this summer when Lollapalooza and take more measurements in that same area. Uh, we've also made measurements of 5G millimeter wave and C-band. What we find is that, yes, C-band does uh, increases the median throughput, actually, because it's available on many more places. Uh, than millimeter wave, you're still getting the high throughputs from millimeter wave, but C-band is much more available. So I'll conclude with a few lessons, and again, my opinions uh, about key takeaways and what we should be thinking about. Uh, coverage is really limited. It's about half a city block. Uh, we've, we've heard about bits per second per hertz per area a lot. I think we need to add the per dollar uh, metric to it. Uh, because we really have to look at to what that kind of density is going to cost us. Sustained throughput is difficult, uh, given the kind of handsets we have today. I didn't talk about latencies, but latencies are still very high. This very well could be due to non-standalone, and I'm looking forward to seeing this go down as more standalone gets deployed. Uh, median throughput over C-band increases, um, but you're still getting the really, really high throughputs from millimeter wave. Finally, um, some thoughts that I'd like to leave the community with. I think we need to rethink the PHI if you're going to continue at higher frequencies. Uh, OFDM with its high PAPR is not the right waveform. Uh, we need to really think about deployments. I think this was uh, touched on by many of the previous uh, uh, speakers. Is outdoor mobile cellular network the right application for high frequencies? We've heard that most data is consumed indoors. So we really need to rethink as to what 6G network deployments look like. Um, and then finally, I will talk about the 7 to 24. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, I am the co-chair of the FCC TAC work group on advanced spectrum sharing. This is a band we are focusing on for next generation, but these bands will require sharing. No ifs, ands, or buts, it will require sharing. 3GPP is not developing uh, the 6G waveform for sharing. Um, we added on sharing with 5G and RU, but I think it is worth going back and natively redesigning 6G to, to operate in shared spectrum. Finally, let's keep in mind, we are going to coexist with passive applications in these bands as well. We do not want to repeat our 5G and weather radar and 5G FA controversies when we're looking at 6G. And I'll stop there and happy to take questions. Thanks a lot, Monisha, and good, uh, good last point. Uh, so we have a couple of questions on the chat screen. I'll just uh, scan the room here if we have any questions in the room. All right, so we'll take the online one. Uh, first question, uh, were there any studies that were conducted on the impact of human, on humans in these wavelengths uh, in areas such as the Hutchinson Park? Does dense human population impact the throughput? That's actually a question uh, that we want to address. Uh, a lot of these measurements were taken during uh, the shutdowns, COVID shutdowns, uh, where there were not too many people around. Um, and a lot of the outdoor events that usually happen in these parks uh, were canceled. 
uh, that's changed this summer. We do plan to go back in there uh, and take limited measurements. Uh, we are not going to be able to go in with laptops. Um, so we do plan to do that. Um, as to the impact on humans, uh, I cannot say that. Uh, I cannot really draw any conclusions from the measurements we've made as to what the impact will be. Uh, I think this was addressed in a, in a previous talk. I do believe that we should be taking more measurements. I don't believe that the levels we are seeing are harmful, uh, but if the density of these millimeter wave base stations do go up, it, it, it's good to take measurements. Uh, we don't know what we don't measure, so uh, more measurements are better. Thank you. And the next question is, while it's interesting that temperature throttling is occurring, what's the real world impact as most users wouldn't be downloading that amount of data? I don't think it is the amount of data it is. So a big part of reduced latency is the fact that you can download a large volume of data in a very short time. Uh, now, if it so happens that you're going to be doing about 400, 500 megabits per second anyway. Uh, firstly, what impact does that have on the latency, which we are projected that we are supposed to get these one millisecond latencies over the air. Secondly, is we can get that kind of data rate today with 4G, and we can definitely get that data rate with mid-band 5G. So then the only thing that remains where millimeter wave is really uh, giving us added benefit is in being able to supply that amount of data rate with many, many users. Um, we don't have the result data that whether that is playing out well either or not. Uh, but I think it's it, it, we need to keep in mind that if we are designing for peak data rates of a certain amount of time, and if you're saying that we cannot handle it, then perhaps we shouldn't be designing for that higher peak data rate. Thank you so much, Monisha. Again, we have a little token of appreciation that we will send it. Uh, we'll try to mail it to you. Uh, thanks again for making the time and joining us and looking forward to seeing you in future events. Thank you very much. Thank you.